What's happening, everybody? This is V3Cast, episode 27, the official Voyager 3 podcast, where Voyager 3, that's us, talk about music, film, collectibles, beverages, and a whole lot more. What's happening, fellas? How you doing tonight? We're good. What's up? I'm speaking for I'm speaking for Greg. We're both good. Oh, <laughs> Greg, you're good, man. Just so you know. <laughs> I feel like a uh, teller. Yeah. All right. Greg, Greg, I'm going to order will, for Greg too it, when we go yeah, to the Aaron will be restaurant. Speaking for me tonight and ordering for me. <laughs> Greg will have. He the, will uh, also be doing my taxes. Nice. <laughs> nice. Aaron, you, you better buckle up. You got a lot of work ahead of you. I'm ready. All right. Well, when you're doing all that work, tell mm. me, what mm. are you drinking? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> uh, tried and true traditional. Coors Banquet. Too hearted. Uh, too hearted. <laughs> too hearted. Uh, no. I can't see Aaron on my screen. I know that that is a staple of YouTube. Y'all love yes. the too hearted. Uh, it was introduced to me by Greg a few years ago, quite a few years ago. It's the original yes. uh, India Pale Ale. I don't know what anybody else says, but they're they're so <laughs> it's not they're, the original. <laughs> it's the original. They're no, such the original not. that they didn't even used to say Pale Ale, India Pale Ale, or whatever on their bottle. They just said like I don't know Michigan Ale or something like that. And now they have to say American IPA because they want everybody to know they were first. They're the original, aren't oh. they, Greg? Well, no, and okay. <laughs> they weren't the first IPA, Aaron. That's just not they true. Were, no, no, they weren't the first, but they were, they were an IPA before IPA became popular, right? I would say they That's were right. at the, the front of the line. Yes. So they, the in, Michi line. in Michigan, of in Michigan, if you will, in India, maybe it was their first. <laughs> 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 I don't even know what I don't know what's gotten into Aaron. What what even is happening? What okay, Greg, what are you drinking? <laughs> We're going right to me. Yeah, man. Yeah, man, because you right, got well, usually a real good surprise. Yes. I'm going ah. non-alcoholic again tonight. Hop tea. There you go. This is the hibiscus one. So dude, not, you got me that before, and I can vouch that it's amazing. What does it taste yeah. like? What does it, it taste like? like? Um, tastes like, well, hibiscus is kind of flowery, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean it's 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 red, and it tastes like uh, tea mixed with like the hoppy bitterness of hops. Okay. But it's it's not sugary at all. It, this when you look at this, it's going to look sugary. Okay. But it's right. not. It's it looks red. sugary. It's not, it's not raspberry. It's not raspberry flavored. No, it's not raspberry. It's, it's not like a slurpy. It's mm. zero calories. So it's literally hibiscus tea and hops. Oh, like a nice. cranberry, like cranberry. I think it's, I think it's good. No, for the it's body. not like a cranberry, Aaron. It's not any kind of berry. <laughs> oh, hibiscus. what's hibiscus? Sugary. Jesus. What the hell is hibiscus? Think of like, Look I think it it's like flour, but, but Google it. Yep. And see what I have access to the it's internet. That's all I get from you guys is I got to Google it myself, do right. my own research. <laughs> okay. Right. I can't say enough about hop tea. If you guys nice. haven't found it yet, you should go look. All right, man. I'll check no, it out. I, I dig it. Greg surprised me with a, uh, was it a six pack or something? It was, you know, two, three, four of them, something. And I, I enjoyed it. It was very fun. Nice. I think you should go to, you, you're going to mostly find those in like your health food stores. That's where I'd start your search. Gotcha. <laughs> Zing, zang, what are you zong. drinking, Steve? Uh, in honor of our upcoming segment, I have a Bungdeberg oh, ginger beer. Australian? Yep, and it's what from Australia. It, ginger beer? Yep. No. It's a very Steve's unique one. A little hint. It's a very He's unique one. A little hint. That's very tasty. See if I can get a good crack on this one. Oh, yeah. What do y'all think about that? Nice. Barely heard it. Barely heard it, but that's okay. We're used to that. Ooh, that's good. Steve, does it's that one, got sugar in it? Aaron wants to know. It does. Yes. Probably well, high fructose corn. Well, you know, I take that back. No, this is real a sugar. This is a family recipe from Australia. So yeah. I'm gonna assume that they take they don't high use quality high fructose standards. corn syrup in Australia. They've probably never used it in any No, it's probably there. outlaw because they're fucking smart and we and right. over here in America we just, you know, want the cheapest and dirtiest. <laughs> right. Does it have any hibiscus in it? Zero hibiscus. That's faux show. 
So um, Aaron will probably like it at that point. Yeah, well, yeah. I might more, be more of a fan of Aaron, that. A case of the hibiscus hop tea. <laughs> That's right. All right, fellas, good good choice on the drinks. Cheers. I got to bring up a cool point: is that we have our very first interview for V three Cast, a outstanding Australian musician, guitar player, that some of you may know from bands like Helmet and Handsome. Uh, we're going to be talking to Peter Mengede. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to welcome Mr. Peter Mengede. Good morning. Thanks for thanks for <laughs> joining us on V3 10 Cast. o'clock a.m. 10 o'clock a.m. in Australia. Let's just remind everybody, he got up early for this. That's right. We're just winding Do it down. appreciate it. He's just winding it up. <laughs> no, I didn't get up. I've been up since 6 a.m. I'm just uh, <laughs> still trying to wake up. There you go. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. More coffee. All right. What do we well, got? always say. That's true. Yeah. And they were on that coffee tour, mug. by the way. Just, just, just saying. Mug. Handsome was. <laughs> Caffeine Nation tour. For those who don't know, uh, Peter has been in two of the coolest bands, in my opinion. Um, everybody knows Helmet. And not everybody may know Handsome, but you should. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we, went, we have a list of questions for you. Uh, and just like we said earlier, just conversation, hanging out and um, getting some cool info and maybe some behind the scenes stuff and just some insights into two of the coolest bands from the 90s, for sure. And by the way, Handsome comes up a lot on our podcast because of Steve. It does. Yeah, <laughs> well, you got, yeah let's, you guys let's live, that. You guys live rent free in Steve's head. <laughs> yeah. This is, you, we didn't we really didn't think anyone liked us. Uh, um, we, we do we do and especially steve you're one of his favorite bands to this day of all time even with only one album it doesn't even matter but you guys were at both bands um are staples in the van you know every every show we went to uh whenever we were driving whether it was a half hour or six hours whatever it we, we were always playing either handsome or helmet or both so I just want you to know um, your your significance in our story, in our world, still to this day. You know, like so. Just just so you know, we appreciate you being here, and we're very honored to have you. Well, thank you for thank you for having me, and thank you. That's very kind of you for listening to us, listening to our, our record, our music, even coming to see us. That's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. multiple times, multiple times. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was there every time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, wanted to start with one that it's a, it's a pretty pretty ballsy move to uproot from Australia and just come to to the U.S. You know, wanting to play guitar. Uh, how did you make that decision? What brought you to that, and what that kind of commitment? Yeah, um, stupidity, <coughs> mostly. <laughs> um, a long story short, um, when I was in high school. You know, we had a band, we were playing Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Sabbath. Um, I was listening to Hendrix. So it was very much in that sort of 70s rock, heavy rock um, kind of area. And then one day I was over at a friend's place and he played Nevermind the Bollocks. Um, and it was Holidays in the Sun. As soon as that, I heard that, everything changed. Everything fucking changed. I went to school the next day. They showed us the periodic table. And I, I just made my mind up at that point. I said, fuck this. I'm not doing this. I want to play music <laughs> and I don't have to be Richie Blackmore anymore. So I went home. I dropped out, of, dropped out of school, ran away from home, moved into our rehearsal room in the city, stayed up there um, and then kind of floated around finding my feet. Didn't talk to my family for two years. Kind of wow. thought they were going to try and drag me back home. Uh, then I had to work out how to support myself. To move so i started working for rocking horse records which is our sort of version of car city an independent record store my guitar teacher got me a job there when i was very young so i was connected in a sense to everything that was going on mostly in the uk mm. which was fantastic it was an incredible time then i moved to sydney i worked for phantom records in retail then hot records distribution um we were doing again independent pure independent music not like today's indie stuff were, um, we had the, the Triffids, the Laughing Clowns, Celibate Rifles, who were a very kind of Radio Birdman, Detroit influence band on the label, uh, doing lots of importing from Rough Trade. So I started skilling up, then I got a job in Melbourne. I noticed all my friends in Sydney uh, who I played with, Australians make a pilgrimage 
they go overseas for two years and it's usually to the UK. Hmm. Um, yeah. I was seeing a girl whose parents told her that if she broke up with me, they would send her to film school in LA. So she broke up with me. So I said, right, I'm going to go to America. Stuff you. <laughs> uh, I saved up my money and I jumped on a plane with a guitar and a suitcase. Uh, I went to LA. It was weird, really weird. Didn't like it. Jumped on another plane. Uh, went to New York where I had two friends from Australia. And um, for the first three weeks, it was brilliant. I had money. It was amazing. So, you know, you're going out to clubs, to bars, to after hours. The first show I saw was Huskadu and Soul Asylum at, uh-huh. at the, the old Ritz. And then it was just incredible. You are in the middle of everything rather than seeing it from the other side of the world. Things became real. And these people were real. They existed, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, anyway, then the money ran out and I had to do a bunch of crap jobs just to survive. And I met, I met this woman at a celibate rifles show. And yeah, we got married a couple of months later. Uh, she turned out to be hugely influential. Her name is Renee Cookero. Um, she started working for Rockpool magazine around then, which along with CMJ was, a, you know, whatever you want to call it, alternative college music mag. Yeah, an influential um, so probably. I was given the, the opportunity to write for them, to do interviews, to review uh, records. And we were A-list. We were just going everywhere. Um, we were there. I mean, like we were practically door people for the new music seminars back then. Mm. Um, it was an amazing time. Then Renee went over to the UK to do a, a Blast First feature. So she was invited by Paul Smith to go over and meet the bands and you know, write up a, a, a feature on them. And she met Paige, who was playing with the band of Susans. He said he wasn't very happy with the band. Uh, and that was because, as I understand it, they didn't like his songs. So he wasn't going to get a look in. Um, she said, oh, you should, you know, you should start your own band. My husband plays guitar. I come back to New York, meet him. So we did meet. Uh, Renee paid for the ad and the voice that found John Stanier. Hmm. Um, so the three of us were working together. Um, everything was just in regular tuning. You know, it's nothing kind of particularly helmetish about it at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, we auditioned a number of bass players. Finally, Henry turned up with an eight-string bass, um, dreadlocks. Yeah. Uh, blow up is the bass speaker in the rehearsal room, and, um, you know, he was great. So we were out. We started doing shows around town. We did an audition. We played at Louderbacks in Brooklyn. That was our first show. Then we did a Sunday night audition at CB's. They started putting us on there. Um, we played a show. There's a YouTube video of it, not necessarily of us, but we played with the Melvins and Nirvana at the Pyramid Club in 89. Wow. And at that point, both the Melvins and Nirvana were using drop tunings. And mm. from the next day on, you know, the songs that Paige came in with were all drop D. We should have gone drop D flat, but it didn't work that out at that point. <laughs> it sounded heavier. So I think that, yeah, that, that that change happened immediately following that Nirvana Melvins show. And I can't oh, say wow. whether it was the Melvins or Nirvana who were responsible, but that, that's where that came from. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so drop D, an early decision for the direction of Helmet Sound. It was something that Paige saw. I went, Right, he jumped on top of it. Just totally right. inspired him, apparently. Yeah, yeah, very cool. One I mean, it, it is bands. awesome. <laughs> yeah, you know, and at that point, Nirvana, um, well, they drew maybe you know, 200 people, 150, <laughs> 200 people. Yeah. They certainly weren't the band that they became later. Right. Yeah, it was that would have been Bleach, Bleach era, right? Yeah, it was, it was a different time. It was a different time. I think it was a time when people were playing the sort of music that we were playing because we wanted to. Sure. Um, you know, there yeah. was no commercial aspiration there yeah. whatsoever. You know, if you yeah. were on, on an indie, um, so with Amphetamin Reptile, I loved Amf- Amrep from the moment um, I saw their Pogo the Clown single. Um, for us, just getting that single out, Born Annoying out on Amrep was just, that's it, we've made it yeah. famous. It's kind of like Steve, 
Was it Steve Martin in The Jerk? I'm somebody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I'd say, you know, whether it was the Melvins, Nirvana, um, maybe to a degree, you know, the Smashing Pumpkins were fairly big indie at that point. Yeah. Um, I think people were still doing things because they liked the music they were, they were making. Yeah. It wasn't about, you know, adopting a style or copying someone in order to get a deal. Right. Yeah. It definitely, I think, evolved to that more so in the uh, mid 90s. It kind of like became a formula, kind of just that's what you do type of thing. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and some people talk about, you know, that, that first sort of rush of bands um, that surfaced in the wake or, or were pushed to the surface. In the wake of the Nirvana around, you know, 92, 93, being sincere. Um, and I, they were because they were already doing it. Right. Right. Oh. Yeah, you know, very and, true. Yeah, that, that wasn't their had, first go around. Did you guys get a sense when you when you started, I guess, gelling in the strap it on meantime, bridging into meantime, did you feel like what you were doing was going to hit people that hard? was going to change things at all? No. No. No, I mean, we've been out touring with the Melvins, and, you know, you, you'd go, that was a, probably our first real tour. Um, you might play in front of 20 people in Lincoln. Well, we played in, in front of 20 people in Lincoln, Nebraska, finished about 2 a.m., got in a van, drove all night, I rode shotgun with Henry uh, to Chicago where we played uh, breakfast, morning tea show at the university there. Um, and then again, with no sleep, drive down the south side of Chicago to a club. I, I, don't, know, I don't think it was a Metro. Grabbed a couple of hours sleep on, um, on a pool table and played that night to a couple of hundred people. Back then, no, we didn't think we were, we were going to affect people. Um, we we're building up a little bit of a following. If we could do 200 people in Minneapolis, that was amazing. If we do, we could, you know, get some people to go to Club Heidelberg. That was that was phenomenal. Oh wow, yeah, Club Heidelberg. Um, it's still here, by the way. <laughs> that was a great place. Wow, great, great place. Um, no, we thought maybe if you you know strap it on, probably sold around at that point. It got to about ten thousand albums on AMREP, and we thought that was that was pretty good. That was that was a great success. Yeah. Um, no, at that point, when you looked around the landscape, what did you see? You know, you said Prince, saw all this, you know, American R&B, Michael yeah, Jackson yeah. type soul stuff. Hair metal was everywhere. It was, you know, horrible <laughs> hair metal. Right. Yeah. So right, sure. unless you were part of that crew, yeah. Well, here's okay. Let me let me phrase it like this then. Even if you didn't know how it was going to affect people, did you know how fucking good you were? Like, did you get? It? <laughs> no. Um, usually, we are, you know, for me, I felt that we were good after we'd been out on a tour for about six or seven days. Mm. After six or seven days, we got good. We started playing well, and then you know, you just and then what you want to do is just keep going and going and going. So you don't lose that, you know, that sort of um, telepathic connection you have with the other guys in the band where you know exactly where everyone is and what everyone's going to do. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's a hundred percent true too, because in the limited amount of touring that we've done, anytime we did a string of shows in order for any length of time, as those days went on, it became a machine. That statement totally resonates. That that's the absolute truth. You know, like the more you get out there and do it in a row, the more like you you described it as telepathic, and that's accurate too. You know, like you just you know where those guys are going to be and when they're going to be there, so you yeah. don't even have to think about it as much. Yeah, no, and you know, you you just everything flows and everything feels amazing. Um, so I I can only think that. Um, so, that, you know, there was a show, I think it was a new music seminar show, perhaps, or CMJ showcase at CBGB's, where we did know that things were changing. Um, usually we play in front of a, you know, a bunch of drunks, <laughs> right. whatever you want to call them, 
um, yeah. you know, the downtown scene. Um, but this time, all these, these guys came in from Long Island, and they would have been either metal guys or hardcore guys from Long Island, and they started turning the, turning the tables up. And for the first time, we saw like a swirling pit right in front of us. At that point, we kind of realized that something, something was changing. And yeah, um, yeah. and then and that continued to happen from there on. Yeah. Yeah, I can remember when uh, Meantime came out in 89X here in Detroit. Um, it was a great station that played and broke all kinds of alternative music and uh, some heavier stuff too. So Helmet would have been one of the ones that would be on a little bit of, a, of the heavier side that they uh, broke. And I remember that summer, um, 92 people were everybody was talking about it uh about that track and the video hit and then you guys came to st andrews and just uh it was sold out it was fucking nuts i'm sure you remember <laughs> absolutely yeah, insane love, love st andrews summer. love detroit so at, at that point um you guys would have been getting ready to record meantime and uh i just wanted to ask some questions about what was it like to record that record working with the producer do you remember uh some gear stuff maybe what the type of console that you were recording on because i love that kind of stuff okay well you know in between us um you know there was a bidding war in between us playing st andrews all around that time and recording um so that kind of changed everything we went, we went with with interscope because they didn't have a large roster primus was the only rock band that they had on the roster they had rico they had that rico suave Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we, you know, Paige wanted to sign with Warner Brothers, but we did sit down with, you know, we sit down and management spelled it out and said, look, if you sign with Warner Brothers on the terms they're offering right now, you're going to go back to your job tomorrow. You're going to be working tomorrow. If you sign with Interscope, you're going to be able to work right to or play. Yeah. So we went with them, um, but we, and we recorded at Fun City. Wharton Tears Studio on 21st, I think it's 21st Street on the east side of Manhattan. But we were, that's where we did Strap It On. Um, we were still in this mindset where in. We didn't want to spend a lot of money on the record because we didn't think it was going to sell a lot. So we didn't want to go into debt yeah. and have a, you know, a huge to unrecoup um, balance that we're, we're going to be saddled with paying off. So, um, it was different than Strap It On in that in Strap It On, we practically, we played in the same room together live. And it was great. And I said, well, I like that record a lot more than Meantime. Mm -hmm. um, so it took us maybe one week to do all the tracking for Meantime. Uh, we mixed it. We did a rough mix down there with Wharton, probably in another four or five days, maybe a week tops. So we did the drums and bass first. Um, then I did my guitars in about an hour and a half. Um, wow. <laughs> I, yeah, we were just trying to not fuck around. Yeah. Right. Right. Did, did you double, uh, the guitars or were they just you? I and, didn't even and... let me double them. I was just saying, oh, that's good. Do it. The guitars yeah. were not doubled. Yeah. Um, and then, so gear wise, it was just a 16 track desk with one, we're using one inch tape. So I didn't have a, a lot of room to mess around. Yeah. Um, I was just using my JCM 800 with a cheap Yamaha GEP 50, you know, rack unit set to the heavy metal setting, scooped, <laughs> plugged into the high input of my amp, which is the worst, probably the worst thing that you could do, but it made the speakers, made the speakers thump. Yeah. Um, Paige was using the JTM 45 with, um, the Yamaha GEP 50 again, set to heavy metal for rhythm. It just produces a really foul kind of digital distortion yeah uh, which we both used at the time and uh, a digitech rack for his lead mm. so i probably spent more time on the lead um, the leads were kind of double tracked so you get these swirling conflicting patterns um or lines snaking around each other yeah yeah so then i guess interscope listened to it and said oh well you know we would like i think it was uh wallace yeah well like what's his first name again andy andy yeah we like andy wallace to mix it have a go at mixing it so went fine um we went out to jersey for the mix and it was great it was really boring you just sit there 
watching him ride the kick, boom, 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 <laughs> boom, yeah. just to accent the, the attack on the kick for hours and hours and hours and hours. And I made one mistake in Unsung they wouldn't let me fix. And that was about it. It was done. Um, it was mastered. And then Interscope set about organising stuff like the, the video, the press. We retained our own press people. Um, and because, you know, if you like, the field wasn't so cluttered at that point, there weren't that many bands coming through, um, they were able to get us into the buzz bin on MTV, into high rotation, got us on some great tours, and, and then we were doing pretty well by ourselves, even headlining on I mean, our headlining tours. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was very exciting. It was a very exciting time. Yeah, yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah, I, uh, I only got to see Helmet once during that era on that album, and it was the, uh, the time when you were support for ministry and Sepultura was before you. And I love Sepultura, especially that album arise that they were on too. So that was a magical show at the state fair Coliseum. Um, do you, do you have any, uh, cool, fun stories or how did that tour go in particular? Uh, the tour was great. It was, um, it was really hard going on after Sepultura. Yeah. Those guys are <laughs> maniacs. <right? laughs> Jesus. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's in the water down there in Brazil, but. So, <laughs> they're amazing. They're, they're crazy good. They're amazing life. Look, it was a, it was an incredible tour. Um, you know, ministry were phenomenal, and the crowds are big. You know, you, you're probably looking at six to ten thousand people most mm. nights, and uh, I'd like to go up and sit in the bleachers and watch. Um, you just have a, a, a whole hockey arena just full of swirling, just massive swirling bodies. That was great. It was, it was yeah. a fantastic tour. Right on, um, there yeah. was a bit of an accident. It was a real accident, actually, um, during that tour in which we played in Baltimore and we had to go to, I think, South Carolina the, the next, for our next show. So we left after the show. Our drum tech, John, and guitar tech stayed back to hang out with their girlfriends. They left late and somewhere near the um, Virginia, North Carolina border, our roadie Umbar fell asleep at the wheel. Uh, and the U-Haul took out 200 yards of guard rail, flipped, tore the top off. I think it tore the cabin off too. So, Holy moly. Um, Umbar had very, very, very serious head injuries. He was airlifted to, to Richmond. John ended up in hospital. Um, so just had broken bones. Our drum tech had a pin through his leg. Um, so that kind of uh, derailed us for a while. And then Stone Temple Pilots stepped in and did the southern dates on that tour from florida through texas before we were able to get going again um that was terrible wow yeah, yeah. Terrible for Umbar. absolutely so um and we picked up we picked up finished that tour in san diego uh we went i went back home to australia we played down there in january then went to japan and then played a show in hawaii and that was pretty much the end of that was the end of the touring cycle yeah and then uh, shortly thereafter, that was the end of my involvement in the band. <clears throat> yeah, before before we get to that, though, like uh, I alluded to this earlier, but like so as a musician, you have, you know, you were, you talk quite a bit about how you guys were, you know, during the Strap It On era, you're like, you know, starting to get really good because you're playing a lot of shows. But then then obviously there comes a point where you sort of flip the switch and now you're now you're at a different level. Now you're playing, like you said, hockey arenas or or wherever. So how does, how does your life change in that span of time? Like, I, I suspect that when you were doing the AMRAP, times were a little leaner, right? So like, what, what really changes when you get to that next level? Like, are you guys able to live off of what you're, what you're doing on the road? Like, are you guys obviously don't have day jobs, but I mean, like, how, how well are you doing or how, how comfortable do you get before? Okay. On, you know, on the on Amrit, when we're touring, you lose your job when you go out on tour. Right. You do a three-week right. tour, you lose your job. So that's fine. You'll deal with it somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't, you know, you know, what do you call a musician without a girlfriend? Homeless. <laughs> right. You're going know, you to lose your apartment unless you can find someone to sublet it. And then on tour, you're living on $10 a day per diem. That's what you get. 
right? You're lucky if the, the venues supply food. Um, so I think it was about 10, maybe it was 20. I think it was probably 10, somewhere in that area. That's all the money you make. At the end of the tour, you come back, and I remember that we may have made $300 each. Uh, wow. You get out of the van, you know, take the gear up to the rehearsal room and just go your separate ways. That's it. You've got $300, and you've got to figure out how you're going to survive until the next tour, and all you want to do is go away again instead of right. hanging around Manhattan, waiting or doing nothing. Um, so it was really at that stage it was i've said this before it was one for all at that point you know we would disconnect the odometer the speedometer from the van so we didn't have to pay mileage we didn't know how fast <laughs> we were going henry was pulled over uh in northern california doing uh 90 or something because it was late at night and he just kind of zoned out and he had to pay his own speeding ticket uh, the band wouldn't even cover the fucking speeding ticket. Um, so everyone was chipping in, you know, people lost their jobs. Everyone paid for recordings. We all contributed money towards the videos. Uh, operating costs of the band were all shared equally. Yeah. Now, once you yeah. get to Interscope, um, we got a signing bonus. I think we each got about $10,000 for us, for our signing bonus. The, uh, I think there was a gear budget, but we didn't per se have control over that. That was sort of done through page and management. They decided what sort of amps and backline we were going to get. Uh, and then we were on, I think, $1,000 a month. That was our retainer. And $20 a day per diem. That was so it. You, you moved up a little. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. you guys could get the uh, combo meal this time. <laughs> yeah, and we got hotel rooms. So, yeah. we're not, uh, you know, trying to find somewhere to stay after a show or, you know, hit people up to stay on their lounge or under their table. No one had to sleep in the van anymore overnight to guard the gear. We had hopefully roadies or someone, a road crew to do that for us or to make sure it was safe. Um, we, yeah, we had hotel rooms. That was a big thing. It was a huge thing. Yeah. yeah. More. We had a mixer and tour manager now, and we had a guitar tech. So it was huge. Yeah, for sure. Um, Moving on up, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and while you're doing that, you got to bear in mind that all of the operating expenses at this time were borne by the band. So the band's paying for your recording, for your mixing, for your mastering, for your independent promotions, for your video budget, for your health insurance for all of your salaries, for the crew salaries. Uh, what else do we have going on at the time? Let's give you a, a rough idea, all, you know, gear expenditure. The band pays for all of that. Um, so that was all, you know, being logged on our account, if you like. Yeah. Um, and then there was a separate income stream in that band. That's the publishing. So where there was money that was coming into the songwriter, that was quarantined, if you like, from the the operating expenses of the band. So while things looked very iffy with the band, um, it was one for all. And then once you know some serious sort of money started started coming through, um, it became more a case of all for all for one. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So my take on it was that, um, you know, we're getting ready to go out and tour meantime, and Henry, John, and I were just going through the set, and John asked, he said, well, what are you going to do if Paige comes in with another song that goes da-da-da, da-da-da? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, so, well I, I think that um, we'd like to, I'd like to contribute some ideas, and that I think that we should all have our contributions uh, acknowledged. Sure through the publishing. So John Henry said, yeah, it's a good idea. I went off to our management and had a talk to him about it. Um, our manager also happened to be Paige's publisher. Mm. So it went over like a lead balloon. And I suppose that the you know atmosphere in the band was pretty much poisoned after that. Um, and I was sober. I've been sober for a couple of years by this point. So I was very aware of what was going on. Um, I could see which way things were headed, but you know, you get to a point where you have a choice. 
Um, you can either kind of stick around and suck it up and really be taken advantage of, or you can just say, fuck this, I'm out of here. Right. Yeah. So ended up out of there. I mean, it really starts to become more of a business at that point. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, that's basically a P and L sheet, you know, you've got operations, you've got publishing coming in. It's all separate. And yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally understandable though. You know, you, just like you say, you have to take a, an account of where you're at in your life and your goals and aspirations and creativity and outlet. And, and at the end of the, and the end of that math problem, there's an answer. And that was your answer. It yeah. Makes, and you makes have to sense. ask yourself, you know, does this feel right? Um, and it didn't. It yeah. did not. Right. So, um, yeah. to agree, to a degree, that was the end of that. And I'm in, I felt really bad about it at the time. And I probably wasted too much time feeling bad about it. And, mm -hmm. um, but in talking to Henry and John more recently, no, I just realized I'm so lucky. Did absolutely the right thing. Um, you know, I came out ahead and I got to go off and do something, something else. Yeah. Um, you know, I, and Henry and John ended up $200,000 in debt to Interscope at the end of the day and nothing. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think this is the part that Steve's been waiting for. Yeah. I think we, I think we've covered helmet. So what does that leave? What does that leave us with Steve? You're right. Ahead, Steve. Right. Well, <clears throat> that brings us to the next chapter in your career, which would be the group handsome. Um, how did handsome come to be like, you know, you taken over from when you said, I, I got to leave guys from, from helmet. Um, kind of what's the journey. Actually, I didn't other? say I got to leave. I was pushed. Ah, gotcha. No. I gotcha. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's, that's kind of understandable. If someone says that the, you know, they want to cut of the publishing and they want to write. Yeah. Right. Right. You see how that evolved. Um, so anyway, so I was, um, right. Fuck. You know, you, you sort of work towards something for most of your adult life and you get there and you know, it happens and you realize, you know, the chances of that happening was just so infinitesimally small. Um, somehow, somehow you ended up in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. And the universe just changed yeah. suddenly overnight with Nirvana. They just, everyone has to thank them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Totally true. They, yeah. they changed the world. So then, you know, you go from that, from, um, what's the last show we played last show in Hawaii wasn't big, but I think, you know, playing big day out in Sydney and Melbourne in front of massive crowds, I don't know, 10, 15,000 people to, um, you know, sitting on your bed again <laughs> in Suffolk street down the lower East. I think, Oh fuck. What now? Fuck, 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 fuck. Mm. Um, my friend Francis said, you know, what are you going to do? said, you know, you're probably somewhat hot right now, but you might not be in a few weeks. You should do something. So um, I said, I will. I'll go to Tompkins Square Park and sit in the grassy knoll. So <laughs> I sat there feeling sorry for myself. And this guy came up to me and he said, um, are you uh, are you Peter Mangaday from Helmet? I said, yep. He said, I'm Eddie. Uh, I play bass. You know, it'd be really cool if we could play together. I said, all right. Yeah. It's great. Let's let's get together. So he came around to his my place with his base, um, and he had you know all these great base bases for songs, bass riffs um, yeah. that I could work off. Um, and I showed him some of the things I was coming up with, and we just bounced off each other really well. So he and I started playing together. Um, I ran into Tom Capone on St Mark's Place. You know, we had a little bit of a chat about quicksand. And he said that Pete Hines asked uh, him if he knew any drummers. He said, oh, yeah, Pete Hines, he's, he's not doing anything at the moment. Uh, he's at Teachers College, so we got in contact with Hines. He came down. We had a play. It was fantastic. Uh, we had a guitar player called Mark Stanley for a little bit, but there was a margie margie about him wanting to be the singer, and we were, we were sort of looking for something different in a singer. Yeah. So we started playing together. Um, we had to wait a couple of years for Pete 
to finish teachers college and I was tied up in litigation with Helmet anyway. So, I mean, they left me $10,000 in debt with the IRS by um, misinterpreting my, my advice and not paying my taxes. And they held on to all my gear and all my royalties. So, you know, I had to work, um, go back to working a day job to support myself and the band. So that was a kind of rough couple of years. So, yeah, we started riding together. And we were looking around for singers, and we probably tried 200 people in Manhattan through, you know, talking to people, placing wow. ads, doing auditions. Um, it was amazing that there really weren't that many people who could who could hold a tune or write a lyric, <laughs> or who were the whole package. And then uh, Pete Hines found Jeremy. We sat down at a, a diner in Park Slope, and I explained to myself, you know, whatever we do with this band, the most th- important thing to me is that. Everyone's going to be treated equally. Everyone gets a, an equal share. Uh, and we did, and I'm proud of the fact that we did do that. So we, we split everything equally. We got a yeah. publishing deal with Chrysalis. That went, that went five ways. We included Tom Capone mm. in that. Um, we, even, we signed to a major as a four-piece. So uh, oh, gotcha. I think we, we also mm. took care of Capone. He came after the fact there. But that was really important to me. Everyone contributed. Um, everyone had ideas. Everyone had input. Everyone had massive input in putting the songs together. So, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a master plan. It was just the way um, that things came out with the four of us yeah. combining, pooling. So how, how did Handsome get the deal? Were you able to, to leverage the fact that you were in Helmet? Did that help? Obviously, must have helped. Plus, you know, you got Tom Capone from Quicksand and a few other names that are, are known, obviously, in the scene. I'm just I'm just curious how the how the record deal came. With, with uh, at, at that time, yeah. So my wife, ex-wife, by that stage, was working at Jive Records, uh, and yeah. she helped us enormously. She was a, an amazing motivator and networker. So Renee Cookero supported the band financially. She was a person buying all the drum skins and drumsticks, and you know, paying for for demo sessions. Um, she put out our first single. Uh, in concert with Bettina Richards from Full City Blend, I think. Uh, she sent the demos off to, to Jonathan at Sub Pop. Uh, she booked the shows. She invited the record company people to Brownies, to Coney Island High. Um, wow. So it was through her. And I had no, you know, Tom wasn't even in the band at that point, so I had the Helmet thing really didn't have much to do with it. Had nothing to do with it, I think, you know. Yeah. Nothing. Zip. Um, also Eddie Nappy was really, really well connected from his days living in Los Angeles. So he knew Michael Goldstone from hanging mm. around, you know, Hollywood. So Michael Goldstone ended up being our A&I, A&R guy. Uh, but in terms of getting the deal, that was just the, the, you know, there was a, there was a frenzy. It was like a, sh- it wasn't a feeding, bidding war. It was, it was a shark feeding frenzy at that, at that point. Record companies were everywhere. Everyone was trying to find their next band. Yeah. Um, everyone was getting signed. And we got a huge deal. We got a $1.2 million deal with Epic. Um, with, you know, the usual out clauses that your lawyer doesn't like to emphasize. Um, <laughs> so those deals at the time were sold to bands as being, you know, two or three firm deals. But they, they contained something called a leaving member clause, whereby if one member of the band left, the record company could just walk away from the contract. So, oh, so that, that opened up there. an option for them to do that if they so chose to. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so we got the deal. Yeah, there was a bidding war. Um, we talked to Concrete. We talked to um, labels. We talked to East West. We talked to people out on the West Coast. Lots of labels. But we finished up going with Epic, uh, largely because of Michael Goldstone. Yeah, that's got to be pretty gratifying to sort of do, you know, to spin up a band on your own and have it reach that level. I mean, like you, you were talking earlier about how it's kind of a once in a lifetime, but, you, you know, obviously something you're doing and the people that you're surrounding yourself with sort of, you know, was lightning in a bottle, so to speak. And, and you were able to make that happen on your own. So I, I, I would imagine as a musician, you know, that's got to be a pretty good feeling. Yeah, with me, it would have been different from the other guys because they hadn't had the same sort of experiences I've just had. <clears throat> Where I was probably used to, you know, playing in front of a, a room full of people who were just going off, going mm-hmm. completely beating the hell out of each other. 
When we played with Handsome, we tended to just see people standing there. I thought, oh, fuck, this is not going over well. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> we're bombing. I always felt like we were, you know, even if we played really well, I felt like we were just going, we were just bombing out. So we didn't get that live feedback gotcha. from the audience. So yeah. I uh, would uh, put that into the category of it, it, handsome was plenty heavy for sure, but it wasn't that kind of macho hit inducing thing that like maybe like Pantera or Helmet had. Um, so not your fault. I just think it's, it was a different mojo to me because I mean I'm, I'm not a pit guy at all. And every time I saw you, I was in the front singing with Jeremy. You know, singing right <sighs> to him. So I I don't like pits personally, but I think your guys' stuff's more heady. And uh, yeah, exactly. It, it's not. It I mean, want, not all music uh, is meant that. for that. Yeah. 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 yeah well, I guess definitely. You know, you know, well, Pete Hines came from the Chromags. So he sure. wanted to avoid he wanted to avoid that sort of you know cro magnum yeah, uh, yeah. cross the tracks watch your back <laughs> <laughs> man yeah and I do have to say about about Pete Hines like the music of Handsome is interesting enough but you could count on Pete to put the fucking best drum fill just after a riff had gone like two times and something could happen some bands choose not to but he put it right there just perfectly it's there's never a dull moment in any song it's just an, an unbelievable and i know he probably thought about that because being in a band we understand about you know fitting things in and arrangement and stuff like that but he just oh man he, he did it every time every song <laughs> yeah, he was he was just so key um in terms of arrangements he did so much, and that's why it's, it was only fair to treat everyone equally. Yeah. You know, just as John and Helmet was just pretty, you know, intrinsic as far as arrangements being being worked up and developed. Uh, he he was never so he never came out of that as well as he should have. Yeah. But yeah, Pete Hines. Pete Hines was a, just such an in, incredible part, as were everyone, as was everyone in the band. Everyone was yeah. you know, very important. Yeah, and Tom Capone added just only the best hot sauce to to the songs that were already great. Just like all the like the harmonic stuff that he does, where he kind of just taps on the on the strings in the, in, in the one chorus, and just uh, just his stuff with the the phaser and yeah, just yeah, we're, paceful we're, all over the place. So we were recording with Terry Date in Seattle, and at one stage, um, Terry Terry looked over at us. Um, Hines was there. I was there. And he said, "There's a." Uh, so has, has, has Capone done his solo on this one yet? And, and Hines said, eh. He said, no, Capone doesn't play solos. He plays area codes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> um, so, Handsome, uh, who thought of the name? I did. Okay. Uh, Brilliant came, name. Yeah, well, uh, a band that we toured with um, from Chicago called Tar, had an album called Handsome. I really liked Tar. thought it was brilliant. So I thought it was a great name. It also alphabetically came before Helmet, so it would have had to sit in front of them in the racks. <laughs> that's that's the best answer well, ever. Well right played. There. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. When I, when I listen to, to Handsome, one of the things that stands out about you guys is uh, it seems like each song has the, the most epic guitar parts them not necessarily noty riffs that it didn't seem like you guys were doing that as much but big guitar parts like tunes super catchy and memorable but epic it, it, were you were you trying to make each song like I, I mean i can hear you i can hear you working when i he, listen to it trying to make each, make each song stand out Maybe were you thinking of like, well, could we start a show with any song on the album or do we have to be married into one song? Or how did that go coming up with those riffs? Uh, well, the riffs in the first instance were Eddie and I. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were just coming up with things that we thought sounded cool. Mm -hmm. When Tom came along, what we wanted to do was not waste two guitars. So mm -hmm. helmet to a degree, even though, you know, I had that kind of visceral, visceral impact. The guitars were to a large extent kind of wasted. I got bored playing with one finger in helmet. Mm -hmm. Most of the riffs were just single, single note, 
you know, uh, right, drop, sure. drop, drop riffs. We got pretty, actually, we got pretty dull after a while. So what we were looking for was a, like a much wider spread with yes. the guitars in Handsome. Um, we did want those harmonic overtones. Um, Tom was great at adding some sort of melodic dissonance to what we were doing. And I guess probably there were, there were, there was a kind of set of rules that you had to follow if you were a band from the lower east side of Manhattan, right? If you played anything, if you played at Brownies and you busted out anything that sounded like a slash solo, people would have just stood there, you know, looking like they'd stepped in dog shit with a hole in their shoe. I saw an LA band do that much. You don't do that. You can't do that. You got to look like, you know, you're some uh, tortured post television, you know, Rambo, drug addict, fucking yeah. poet right. on the lower east side. Um, and you got to be nasty. Those were kind of the rules. You couldn't, you couldn't do any of that, you know, kind of mainstream rock, rock stuff, which is good because I was, I was kind of schooled out of that anyway in Sydney mm -hmm. uh, during the, the mid 80s. So we we're affected by this kind of anti-rockist yeah. uh, point of view coming from the UK at yeah. the time. Um, so you had to, if you're playing in Manhattan, you had to be, you know, kind of hopefully re reasonably smart. Uh, you had to be aggressive. You had to be melodic. You had to be dissonant. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what that's what we were looking for. Yeah. Uh, in hindsight, you know, we probably could have worked on getting our, you know, working on riffs that were a little more mathematical, that would have encouraged pits, but we'd done, we done that. Okay. We'd done that in Helmet. And going out and doing Helmet Part 2 would have just been really fucking lame, really. Right. right. Yeah, no, Handsome is is nothing like Helmet. And, and really not like Quicksand either. I mean, it, it just stands out in its own. It sounds like New York, that's for sure. Oh yeah, well, for sure. It doesn't sound there, like any band that I've ever. Different parts of New York, right? Lower East yeah. Side, Manhattan. You got to be drug fucked. You got to be. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be a bastard. Um, <laughs> and but if you got a you got a Long Island, you got a Queens, you got a Staten Island, right? Then you're you're in kind of you know Guido hair metal territory. Yeah, and you know, I don't want to go there. <laughs> right. No. Right. <laughs> I mean. No offense. That's actually that's actually what I like about Handsome is like if you look at the people that are in that in the band, you're like, oh well, I have a sense of what this is going to sound like, and then you hear it, and it's its totally own thing, and it's just so cool. And like like you said, I mean, there's so much going on in terms of like the dissonance and the chords and the the notes that you guys are choosing and stuff. And, and, and to hear that that was all intentional is great, you know, but you guys really did like sort of like chisel your own spot somehow in that, like you said, wide field of bands trying to, to do what was going on at that time. And uh, I think I think the album really stands out as being very, very different and very much like much better than most of what was coming out around that time. So thank you. Yeah. Just really well written stuff, and I mean, you had all the right people playing it. <laughs> oh. Yeah, definitely. Now, I I saw a couple of uh, YouTube clips um, where you guys were. I think you were on tour with Silverchair at the time, and uh, there was a DJ or some kind of a video host guy interviewing you guys. And uh, Pete Hines seems like he's a hilarious dude. And what you were just mentioning about his uh, commenting on Tom Capone's solos. Uh, do you have any other memorable uh, anecdotes or situations where where Pete was you know, off the wall, off the chain, funny or anything like that? Um, he was just fantastic to be around. Just, 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 just kind of he was just sort of full of this leprechaun glee. <laughs> he was evil, <laughs> really fucking funny. Um, I just one thing I can probably say is that um, at one point we did get a bus. We got out of the van. Eddie refused to tour unless we had a bus. So we bought a, we rented an old beat up bus and we're on a long trip from Salt Lake City to Seattle. And I remember one morning, you know, everyone had their bunk beds. I remember Jeremy going to put his socks on. 
going, oh, oh, Heinz, Heinz, Jesus. Um, so Heinz was um, kind of fond of jerking off in Jeremy's socks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. No oh, my way. goodness. <laughs> no, I've never heard of doing it in yeah, somebody right. else's sock. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a V3 cast exclusive right that's there. That's right. That's right. No, nobody will ever forget. He, Jeremy will never forget that. He, he might not even wear socks anymore, by the way, just from that trauma. Yeah, he's just traumatized. <laughs> yeah, poor kid. He went through so much in that band. He was he was um, traumatized, you know, while we were recording uh, in Seattle. Okay, Seattle, working with Terry Day was really, really good. Really, really good. Uh, I can whereas, imagine. Whereas with Helmet, I took an hour and a half doing my guitar for meantime. Probably took closer to maybe two days with Handsome. And the first day of that, maybe three days. Um, the first day of that was about working on a guitar sound. So yeah. at that stage, we had a gear budget. So, you know, we went out and bought gear. Eddie bought a mountain of gear. I bought a like a, a Bradshaw CA3 preamp, uh, a VHT Silverface power amp second hand. Um, I bought a, a 320 watt uh, 1960B cabinet off Tom. And I had a TC electronic four band parametric EQ in the rack. So that's what I was using at the time and a cheap zoom half rack effect unit for modulation. Yeah. And yeah, I went to had a Marshall amp modded. We tried that. That sucked. I had a you know an original Jubilee, which I tried. That just didn't record very well. Um, they were all just way too low gain. So Terry, what we eventually did was we took the Bradshaw, ran it through the um, through the TC electronic and boosted a couple of frequencies, and then hit the hit the front of the power amp really hard, mm. and that became my my guitar sound. Um, I think I went to a JMP one after that, which just worked really really well. So working mm. with Terry was great. We got great sounds. He spent yeah. time getting good sounds. That's we one thing a... that I can say in particular about the record is that the guitar tone is like no other album in, in in my vast music collection. There's something about like the low mids that were like focused and and exaggerated, if you will, that nobody, probably most people would choose to cut those. I, I, I'm assuming, you know, a lot of times, but the, Terry and, and you guys, whatever, the way that the guitars fit in that mix on the self-titled, it's like no other album, and it and it works. And Jeremy's vocals are just right there. I got, I would almost say some people might go, "Hey, can you give them a couple more dB?" But it's not; they're not too quiet. But they're they're just tucked. It's just wonderful. That whole mix is right on the money. So that that guitar tone was pretty much like that after you guys got that gear, or or was there more tweaking in the mixing, uh, if you recall? It was done at the gear stage. And I gotcha. remember um, Terry saying, the TC parametric EQ, he said, this is our friend. This is it. This <laughs> is what's doing it. And I think in terms of low mids, um, it might have been that Eddie was playing, uh, he was playing a Music Man bass. So yeah. it was really scooped. So there was somehow room carved out of the bass in the low mids to fit the guitars. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, so unique. Drums, Huge room, you know, they had, they had a 128 track SSL desk. I think we had 248, 224 tracks machine slaved together, two inch tape. Um, we had a, a huge tracking room. So Eddie and Pete did the drums and bass live with a couple of bass punches afterwards. Mm. I spent a couple of days doing my guitars. Were those doubled or, 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 or just? Yeah, all, all doubled. Okay. Which is great. First time. It's done properly. Right. Uh, then we did, uh, Tom was using a triple rectifier, but believe it or not, a heavy metal distortion pedal on top of that. Oh, yeah. Huh. Plus he had a, like a, a Mutron that he picked up at a, a store out there that gave you all that sort of squelchy, squelchy noise. Oh, yeah. A couple yeah. of days on Tom's parts, probably a week or so on the vocals, and then we were there for the mixing for every step of it. Okay. Every moment of it. So we would mix a track. We would go out to the, the van, play it on the van speakers, come back in, tweak, 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 tweak. Um, so Terry was um, fantastic to work with. Yeah, he's done so many cool. records that I love. So uh, that's awesome. Very cool. And uh, did you guys want to work with Terry Date? Or did you did you have a list of producers that you were like hoping to get? Or how did that work? Um, Eddie did. Eddie had a list of people he wanted to work with. And that was probably based on um, 
their commercial success at the time. Gotcha. But our, but um, I'm pretty sure Michael Goldstein suggested Terry. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Man, incredible. I found out later on through watching some other YouTube videos of like some producers that I like and and follow that um, Ulrich Wild, who now has a you know very big name for himself, he was uh, assistant engineer on your record with with uh, Terry. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was formal. And Ulrich had a um, little hobby at that time. So the internet was still pretty new. Um, he liked to collect pictures of diseased genitalia and show them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Come here, come here, come into a side room. Yeah. What do you got? I mean, some horribly, you know. Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, thanks for that. Yeah, I'm about to record my part now. Now I got to <laughs> think about that. <laughs> Let me ask one other question that, that could possibly uh, have it, uh, the recording aspect that like we're talking about now um, come into play is I just discovered like two nights ago that you guys did a track with KRS-One. Uh, I had no idea all these years, but I'm, I'm kind of prepping for this episode and, I, and, and I'm looking at that. A video comes up and I'm like, what? So I play it and I can tell that you guys because it's a similar era uh, maybe even the same sessions, I don't know, but it sounds a lot like the self-titled. And then KRS-One's rapping over it. Sounds very cool, but I'm like, what? So uh, tell us a little bit about that, if yep. you recall. Okay, so Renee, uh, ex-wife by that stage, is working at Silvertone Records, which was Jive's blues um, label, and KRS-One was on Jive. A few bands have been doing their sort of rock rap, metal rap songs around that time, and Chris... So he wanted to give it a shot. So um, Renee and her boss, Michael Golds, uh, Michael Tedesco, said, oh, you know, well, yeah, Peter's got a band. Why don't you, why don't you check him out? So he came out to our rehearsal room on a Friday night. We played a few riffs. He said, I like that one. Can I get a tape of that? I said, sure. Um, so I'll see you on Sunday. So we went to, I think it was River Sound, Steely Dan's studio. Wow. Uh, and we just went as a three piece. So it was myself, Pete and Eddie. Uh, we went in, did that first track in maybe an hour and a half too. He gotcha. sang over it. I think we put down another riff and then we still had studio time. So he said, oh, okay, I got this other idea. Um, can you guys put down kind of like a, and Edie Brickell and the New Bohemians vibe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. That's a, that's a no, hell of a stretch, no. right? <laughs> yeah. Not a hope in hell. No. <laughs> so um, we kind of, you know, were a bit embarrassed and we left. Uh, we did a rough mix in there and uh, it was great. It was a great day. And then, uh, yeah, Chris threw it on the album and that went gold. Thank you very nicely. Have us all gold records. Oh, really very nice. cool. Yeah, I couldn't believe that, and I wasn't quite sure if, like, a, it was done just for that, like, yeah, it like was. it turned out to be, or if it was a track that didn't make the self-titled, and then they just didn't use Jeremy's vocals, whatever those would have been, and then they maybe edited it or whatever, you know. No, no, it was just a riff that we, you know, we threw together. I guess we used to collect, collect song bits and riffs and song parts and sometimes you'd find that this fits with this this one or this goes with that something i had worked with something eddie had and we put songs together that way very few of them were just written you know beginning to end in one one sitting i think right. dim the lights was the only one that was i did that on an acoustic guitar just playing around with an open g tuning hmm. so it was kind of equal parts you know, that which I was listening to at the time and had listened to in the past. So a little bit big country and a little bit um, Frank Black. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, speaking of uh, Dim the Lights, I noticed that um, at, at first I just thought it was a remix. But then when I researched more, it's actually a whole other recording uh, of Dim the Lights. So I, I'm assuming uh record label wanted to try to make that a single and and they wanted it more polished or something or more radio friendly different yeah 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 they wanted a single so they put us in the studio with michael beinhorn and we 
you know, Hines was terrified because Bonhorn had a reputation for getting rid of drummers and bringing in session guys. So oh, wow. drum setup was phenomenal. So Hines had his kit there and either side Bonhorn had set up a huge PA with massive subs. So he was feeding the kick through the subs. Oh, wow. And I think a bit of, a bit of snare too. So he's feeding the drums through the subs while, while Pete was playing. Um, me, I just took my rig in. I got my stuff done in two takes, doubled it. Um, Tom chucked a little slightly hookier guitar over the top. Jeremy did his vocals privately with Michael because the band, people in the band were always giving, giving him a hard time mm-hmm. about his vocals. And, you know, I guess that's uh, – they wanted a single. That was going to be it. Yeah. Go anywhere. But so, it was nice. I, I scored eight greenbacks from the session. Oh, speakers. So we speakers. ended up buying. Yeah, we ended up buying eight greenbacks in case we blew we blew cones and I didn't blow anything. So he said, "No, you paid for them. Take them. <laughs> Take them home." So nice. It was so nice. I just saw on your Facebook that you put speakers in a cabinet. Are any of those those eight greenbacks? Yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yep. Two of them around. So they came All right. in. Finally found a found a home, found a use. There you go. Um, but no, that was great. It was great working with you know meeting Michael Beinhorn and you know, just meeting people of that caliber and spending a couple of hours you know, in a in a control room with them. It's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know the the vocals. Um, you know they're not night and day different, but they are. I would say trying to be a little bit more hooky, if you will. And I don't mean that in a negative connotation whatsoever, but so Michael Beinhorn and, and Jeremy must've kind of tried to carve out a little roadmap to something of that motivation, I'm assuming. So I think you, you were asking at one point why Tom Capone left the band. Yeah. Might've had something to do with um, Pete Hines beating his head in in the back of the van at the parking lot at Ybor City in Tampa after a Deftone show. Probably. Oh, might have had something yeah. to do with it. Yeah. Um, that might do it. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that quicksand were getting back together and i think that's why um i think that's why heinz belted him gotcha uh you know tom said well you know quicksand getting back together it's like jane's addiction getting back together i gotta do it oh fucking great okay off you go and Jeez. you know he got I, stuck in it. i i thought uh that the donnie i forgot his last name donnie though did, did a great job uh yeah, filling yeah. in yeah, he did a great job, but there was something weird happening on stage. We were talking about those low mids before. So Donnie was using a Bogner fish, pr- fish preamp, and it had so many fucking lows in it that whenever we played, all I could hear was this mm. low, low rumble. It got in the way of the bass, got in the way of my guitar. We're playing at um, a festival in Belgium, and his guitar cut out. And you know, it was an open-air thing, and Eddie and I just looked at each other all of a sudden like, the skies, the skies parted. Right. Everything that, just. You know, that's ah, what was you know, happening. We're back. We're back. We're back. Yeah. <laughs> Normal service has been restored. Um, yeah. yeah. Donnie was great. And it was probably just a matter of cutting back some of those frequencies would have made a huge difference. And the other thing about Handsome too is, yes, I have seen some YouTube videos. Uh, I got a, a copy of a board tape from, um, from New York. And I really hope that we didn't sound like that out front. Uh, there's one. Not, not any time I saw you. And every single Detroit show I saw, and it sounded like the record in my head sitting there. So I take that for it's whatever it's worth. <laughs> everything I've seen on YouTube sounds, sounded like just like crap, um, except for one show at the, the, the church in Philadelphia. Uh, oh, was, was that with Orange 9mm? Yeah. yeah. That one sounded like us. Yeah. When you guys did that, show in detroit it was in the shelter i was there for that one too pretty sure it was in the shelter well, which we're is trying to look around. well pe- people were thinking about um issuing reissuing some live stuff and we looked around but couldn't find anything that was worth reissuing yeah the tapes um that we did find just sounded horrific and then listening to those i thought well okay well maybe that's why no one the audience was moving like we just sounded that fucking that crap Man, I, no. I, I, when I saw you guys, man, it was it was life changing experience. I can tell you that seriously. And I'm a musician, oh, so I, I would know if it was fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Relief. Yeah, I think I, I think uh, most musicians are their hardest critic. You know what? Speaking. Oh, just one very good story about Pete Hines. Okay, so we're, yeah. we're touring. 
Um, we're in St. Louis and we played a show and there was some footage of that show and that one definitely sounded like shit. Like, it wasn't working out the front at all. And I was saying, man, Gibby just didn't have it that night. And then he said afterwards, okay, let's all go off gambling and, you know, even though we lost at the show, we'll be winners when we gamble. So, I'm like, okay. So we got on one of those river boats and he lost. And he lost <laughs> fucking big. And he got really, really drunk. He got so drunk, we had to take him back to the hotel and put him to bed. Then the next morning, Heinz hatched this plan. He said, okay, we're going to go in and talk to Gibby. So, okay, now we'll just follow your lead. So we go in and say, hey, Gibby, Gibby, you know, what, what, what the fuck's up with this, you know, management's freaking out. He said, why? What about? It's about those underage girls you had in here last night. What? What underage girls? What are you talking about? I don't remember anything. Yeah, yeah, they got photos of you with these two 15-year-old girls with their hands down your pants. What the fuck are you doing? You fucking idiot. And he says, no, no, no. He says, look, they're trying to manage it. It's trying to call right now. No, it's not management. It's the fucking police. So what do the police want? What is it the girls? He says, no, they found a van full of gear. It's in the river. <laughs> Holy shit, he's piling it on this poor guy. Yeah, wow. Poor Chris. Poor Chris is just, he he oh, started man. crying. He was crying in bed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that was Hein's idea of fun. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he's never a dull moment, right? Seriously. Uh, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. That, the band was a lot of fun to be in. Heinz was great to be around. Yeah. Jerry oh, was a nice holy. kid. Eddie, Eddie. It was a very smooth, smooth character. And Tom, you know, the whole Satan thing, Satan, Satanism is always very humorous. So, <laughs> right. I, I have yeah, heard people mention that over the years Art about, seriously. about him. Um, one well, of the we, tales I heard is that he likes to keep the bus vault, uh, AC real cold because that's like Nordic or something. I've heard somebody say that before. Yeah, he was in a, he was, yeah, impressed by all the church burnings. We, um, we, Finished up recording in Seattle. We went out to the airport. We're pretty burnt. Bought the first plane out we could, and it was old. We got on it early in the morning. It was a little McDonnell Douglas MD-80 with two jets, two engines on the tail. Um, it looked like the L train. We, we got in. I had a look at the, you know, the pilot's console, and, and it was just all, everything, all the surfaces were worn out. looked like an old subway train. Wow. We got on it. Um, so we're flying along. Capone sitting up there with Heinz, Eddie, and myself. And at about 30,000 30, feet over Omaha, over Nebraska, it felt like we'd been T-boned. So one of the engines shattered. Oh, uh, the rotor just disintegrated, felt like we'd been hit. Hostesses started rushing up and down the aisles. The pilot came, uh, got on the intercom and said, well, you, would have, you might have uh, heard a noise there. Uh, we've uh, experienced an engine uh, malfunction and we'll be making an emergency landing in, uh, in Omaha. So... We had one engine and we just spiraled down. It was dead quiet. No one, no one spoke on the way down. We oh landed, everyone you know, applauded. <laughs> so we're standing at the baggage, baggage carousel afterwards looking for our bags. And uh, so I said to Tom, I said, on the way down, tell me, did you pray? I said, who, the <laughs> fucking devil? <laughs> he said, no, the other guy. <laughs> uh, right right that may cause you to uh rethink things momentarily for sure perhaps <laughs> yeah not so great not so great being friends with the devil at that yeah. point holy moly right. um uh what one question i have for you about and, and it's kind of like the donny era um and that one new york show that you mentioned that's on youtube there's a song on there that Swivel. I never, yeah. What? Where did that come from? And I just where? now, just now, take it was an extra song that we never really recorded. Um, I think there was a demo version of that floating around. I uh, just didn't make it on the album. We didn't think it was good enough. Gotcha. Didn't need it. Yeah. Oh, the vocal yeah, Steve line needs that. The vocal line is so good, and of course, after like the the first part of the verse, and when when you guys are doing the unison chugging, Jesus Christ is like, hey, hit me. But but take it easy. <laughs> I can probably find a copy of that if you don't mind. Uh, just a, an MP3. Ah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take whatever. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know that's why you know that's why Steve brought it up, right? <laughs> He's no, like, no, hey, no. not not for nothing. I'm going to the source. <laughs> we, I'll have to I'll have to look around. It took me a while to dig around, but I'll I'll get it to you. 
That's awesome. I appreciate that. So uh, besides the tracks that made the record and the two that made it, you know, the two that were kind of floating around and closer um, and then Swivel, is that it? Yeah, that's it. We went back to, right, we went back to our rehearsal space on, uh, we're rehearsing up on the east side at that point. And, um, you know, Eddie hadn't really been very close to anyone at that point. Um, Pete said, look, I, I just can't be in a band with Jeremy anymore. Jeremy said, I just can't be in a band with Pete anymore. Oh, those two kind of rubbed each other the wrong way. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, that was pretty much the end of it. We tried, Pete and I tried a couple of different bass players and singers after that, but there was nothing that really sparked. So, yeah, things just went, you know, the record company exercised their leaving member uh, escape clause, Mm. and that was the end of that. Yeah. Man, oh, man, oh, man. I just wanted to, like, since this is V3 cast, we got to talk about a little bit of pop culture, a little bit of uh, other things, be, you know, besides music. What's, what are some great films you've seen recently or recently or old? Like, what are your, what's your, what are your favorite movies? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't get to watch movies anymore. I've got, I've got family. Um, yeah. My favorite movie is Saving Private Ryan. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's just, a good one. Sure. This reminds me of how chicken shit we are <laughs> these days. Yeah. Uh, so other than that, what I do watch is I watch Midas Touch. So always just checking in on the Trump indictments. Oh, um, I watch that, that that YouTube channel all the time. It gets served to me. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I, I watch Warthog Defense to sort of see what's going on in the Ukraine. So those two. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I don't get to watch movies. They watch rom coms nowadays with two girls, yeah. teenage girls. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, what 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 music have you been digging lately? New or old? Okay, it's always going to be old at the stage. Yeah. Uh, lately, the thing I've been playing in the car when I get the car to myself is the Damned Machine Gun Etiquette. Oh I, yes, I love it. I love it. It's just. Now, I saw the dam play in Brisbane a few weeks ago. I couldn't believe that Dave Vanian was there, yeah. that he exists, that he's a mortal. Um, <laughs> I couldn't believe that Captain Sensible was actually quite a quite a nice guy. Yeah. And I love his guitar playing. Yeah. I, I absolutely love it. I love the hooks. I love the way it's not overdone. I like that it isn't underdone either. Um, yeah. And songs like Machine Gun Etiquette, holy fuck. Yeah. They're so yeah. good. Um, so good nice i i tell greg that he uh he looks like dave vanian especially like back in the old days like uh he's got the <laughs> here we go to see greg with the uh eyeliner on and yeah and black lipstick that's all you need yeah i, yeah, I can make that happen <laughs> great i might be a little i might be a little too smitten with him if he did that though i don't know <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome very, very cool. I'm going to have to um, look this guy up. Can I just say one thing? Why Detroit? You know, Detroit being a second home. Okay. Um, oh, there yeah, was a Detroit yeah. scene in Australia. So that, that was um, really sparked by Dennis Tech and Radio Birdman. And he, at one stage, talked about when younger, having seen the MC5 play in Ann Arbor and about the MC5's one, two, three, punch live. Mm. And how that's everything that, you know, Radio Birdman aspired to. That really spawned a whole scene in Australia. Um, so, in a sense, a lot of people from Sydney sort of view Ann Arbor as Bethlehem, if you like. I did yeah. not know that. And as, you know, Ypsilanti, you know, Rainbow Park is the manger. In terms of music from America, um, New York and Detroit. Wow. Uh, Absolutely. Just, the bees knees that's they're everything nice i had no idea Detroit was big in australia that's pretty damn cool to know and it's been like that for a long time you're saying like back it was like it was like that in the late uh mid or late 70s through mid mid 80s into probably into the 90s too yeah detroit had such a a huge influence on australian underground music wow that stage I had no idea. Really I'm gonna have cool. to go down a rabbit hole and 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 listen to a bunch of bands that were influenced by 
Well, you know, look at the Swedish, look at the Swedish stuff like um, Union Carbide, same set of influences, different sort of local interpretation <laughs> of their, yeah, it was huge. So, yeah. Right on. Very cool. Very cool. Um, okay. So since I would consider you a, uh, a seasoned pro being done all what you've done, uh, would, what, do you have any advice for the younger generation coming up that's maybe trying to be in a band or write music together, even solo stuff, whatever it is, what, what's some sage wisdom that Peter Mengede might have for the, for the up and coming? Um, yeah. You know, the world's changed a lot now, hasn't it? No, sure, no yeah. one's handing out money so that people can sit around and write anymore or live the dream. Um, right. The way it used to be was that you would you would write, you would write stuff that you like. I think the more that you write, the better. You're going to get better and better at it. If you don't write, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to produce anything. And if you only write sporadically, it's probably not going to be very, very high quality. Write, 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 write. It's good to have influences, absorb the influences, but don't copy them. Right? <laughs> Try and yeah. do something that's a, that's that, that's you that reflects your personality. Um, don't be a prick. It's a huge one. Be good to the people that you're in a band with, right? Because everyone, everyone's contributing. Um, and do as much of it yourself as you can, right? So even before before this whole, before Nirvana broke, um, people were putting out their records in independent labels. They were taking care of their own shows, shows booking their own tours, doing their own promo, whether it was, you know, distributing videos or flyering or sending out promos to college radio uh do as much of it as you can yourself right don't expect anyone to do it for you yeah makes sense for sure that's great yeah, advice really. okay hopefully that wasn't too depressing <laughs> no <laughs> no right i know <laughs> is there anything you've got going on that you want to like you know um put out yeah, there no, I'm I know playing, you're, I'm... you're doing like guitar lessons and other things since leaving the music industry yeah, well, I went, I went, uh, I came after 9-11, I came back to Australia, went to university, right at, you know, that whole teenage high school dropout thing. Um, went and got a job in the real world, worked in the real world for about 10 years, 12 years. Um, Realised it's really fucking boring. <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, I'd rather play guitar, so I get to play guitar seven days a week at the moment. I got a band going with friends. Um, just got a new guitar player who's so much better than me. That's really exciting. I like playing with people <laughs> better than me. Um, and we're just going to have fun. We're just going to enjoy it. We just keep playing. Yeah. Very good. Sad yeah, Steve's going gonna... to gonna want those demos. I'm just, war <laughs> I'm just warning you. What's the You're name of that like, band? Hey, Peter, uh, what is the name of that band and when's the demo? <laughs> well, the, the bass player came up with the name Hotchy Witch. I don't Hotchie. know what it means, but it's going to be Hotchy Witch. So okay. I, awesome. I just think you know it'd be kind of sad when you get to the point where you know you think oh I can't do it anymore. Um, no, sure. really, yeah, I don't want to be. I don't want to be that person. I like playing. I love playing. No, Always no, have. No. Right. Guitar playing is like OCD. It's a it's a form of OCD. When you get a guitar in your hand, everything's calm. Yeah. You don't sure. Just have a guitar in your hand. So. Yeah. Well, absolutely I, you know we can relate for sure we're always trying to write and record and play on a much of a regular basis as as life allows for sure so yeah we definitely when you understand. get people when you get people who are into it we're going to work with you and can you know excite you and motivate you that's wonderful you have to keep a hold of those people yeah, yeah. you gotta be you gotta be good to them absolutely yes indeed. peter's dropping some truth bombs here i hope yeah. everybody's listening that's right. Absolutely right. Thank you so much for talking to us and taking this time to uh, give us the time of day. We appreciate it. Yeah, very Thank awesome. Thank you very much. The time of day is 11.39 a.m. <laughs> on a Thursday. <laughs> Thanks again to Peter Mengede for coming on here and blessing us with his presence. So we appreciate that. It's super awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the 90s, Steve, just passed out three times. So we yeah, had a blast. Did. He, I don't yeah, know how you even kept it together, man. I'm I, proud of you. I know. I had to, uh, you know, have my incense going in the background and concentrate hard. Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, I was busy texting Steve to play it cool. Don't yeah, right. be an asshole. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Just, just 
don't be an asshole. <laughs> yeah, don't have a moment where you're sitting there with him. And uh, who was the guy who you met, Steve or uh, Greg, at the uh, at, con- at the convention? Oh yeah, you want to revisit that? I'm trying to forget about that. <laughs> well, that artist, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Simon Bisley. Is it Bisley or Bisley? I think I pro- mispronounced it. Well, uh, we'll ask matter. our comic book fans to to correct well, me in the comments. Fan. Let me let me know uh, let me know how you pronounce his name. But yeah, I shit the bed in front of him. Why? <laughs> what of it? What of it? What of it? <laughs> All right, oh, man. All right, so we're going to move on to a very favorite topic here at V3Cast. We're going to give you our Tubi picks. Yeah. I got Tubi, a good one this week. The never-ending oh, supply of classic and modern horror, sci-fi, kung fu, action, even like uh, they got original dramas now. I, yeah. I, I saw some advertisement about a series called Cinnamon. I do not know what it's about, but I, I, I'm going to check that out too probably. Is it sexy? It could be. It definitely uh, could just, because cinnamon sounds sexy. Yeah, it sounds but, a little sexy. Let's put it, it out there. That <laughs> we're not, or um, is it just plain cinnamon? We're not no. endorsed or sponsored or in any <laughs> business deal with Tubi. We just like the shit. Sorry if uh, if it sounds like we're selling out. We just like the shit. We like to watch shit on Tubi. So here you yeah, go. Yeah, because of the selection. Seriously. Yeah, yeah, they I mean, got Tubi everything just, we like. Tubi just seems to have a lot of good content i i you know like karen said we're not endorsed we're no. just telling you what the truth is that's right it's just the truth it's our truth the way we see it greg yeah. you're up you said you got something good what's up it's from 1986. Mm. aaron mm-hmm. knew it was going to be from the 80s <laughs> i like it the movie is wanted dead or alive with rutger hauer and gene simmons as the bad guy nice awesome have you guys seen it Man, wait. So Gene Simmons ago. did two villains. I, he he yeah. did the one with uh, Tom Run Selleck. Runaway, Runaway yeah. with Tom Selleck, and this movie wanted Dead or Alive. And he's done. He did a few other movies in oh, the eighties. Nice. He did one with uh, John Stamos, where he played a mm-hmm. uh, a trans trans guy. He was on a, a roll for him, in the eighties, man. On on a roll. Yeah. So hmm. uh, nice, man. That's my pick. Why nice. dead or alive? Rutger it, Hauer, man. You can't is go he a bounty hunter? Rutger he's Howard. a bounty hunter, right? Yes. Yeah. And he's got the shotgun over his shoulder? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Now you're talking. Yeah, I think yep. Aaron's now seen this a time or two. Yeah, I saw it back in the day. It's got Gene Simmons in it, so you know I, I had to check it out. Yeah. That's right. Mine is, um. there's like a whole genre of movies that, that existed from the earliest days, like the King Kong days up through the seventies and eighties of those movies that are, um, you know, taking, um, people who are, who are going into some sort of prehistoric time, whether they're in time traveling or whether they go into a secret part of the world. Uh, and the, usually the special effects are pretty bad. The dinosaur effects are real kind of laughable, but yeah. there's a certain charm to those movies. And this one is the people that time forgot. Um, 1977. Uh, I saw the, the poster for it, you know, on, on Tubi. And I was like, man, that looks pretty damn cool. And uh, it kind of sucked me in. Um, the highlight of it is Sarah Douglas, who we know from from Superman 2 yeah. as Ursa. We know her from V. We know her from Conan the Destroyer. She's awesome. She's she's always been like one of my favorite, you know, old school character act actresses. Um, she's in the movie and uh, it's actually directed by Kevin Connor, who, who I didn't know. But when I was looking it up, I found out that not only did he do like three other movies like that the the land that time forgot at the earth's core and warlords of atlantis but he did a movie that we all know and love motel hell so oh yeah okay yeah, motel so hell, so good motel yeah. hell's great scared me it so bad me when i was a kid a oh god totally. um so kevin connor's no joke he knew his genre he did four at least four of those you know prehistoric kind of movies this one is like they're they're out in the arctic but there's like some paradise you know um in a completely different uh warm climate in the arc uh in the top of the world and uh, or the bottom whatever the antarctic the arctic whatever and uh anyway there's all these you know like tribes and stuff that are fighting each other uh it's kind of a frank frazetta um 
look that they try to capture in the costumes and stuff. Really cool movie. Really fun. Nice, man. Another sweet pick. I also went back to the 80s. <laughs> and yeah. I uh, I watched the first two episodes of the OG Transformers cartoon. Uh, I think they call mm-hmm. it Generation One, as far as I can remember. But, um, you know, it's when they kind of explain the war on Cybertron and yes. how they get sucked into like that asteroid field and get damaged and crash on Earth. And a uh, bunch of time passes. They introduce the concept of the Energon cubes because they're low on energy when they kind of wake up. Uh, and, and and they're on Earth, and they're like, "What what what is this place? Can we build anything?" And they find there's there's no material anywhere because they're in the middle of the desert. Hmm. And then they uh, in the distance they see I think like a power plant, so they start kind of uh, ravaging that for energy and parts to build like a a fort or a weapon or a ship, anything they can do. Um, so that's kind of the first two episodes basically, and I, nice. I warped right back to the old school and remembered all that stuff and the. The way the music is and how like Scatman Crothers did the voice of jazz, just <laughs> right. loved it, man. And the music is great. And uh, of course, we love it when uh, Soundwave talks because he's, he's got like the Cylon vocoder uh, yes. back down there. Love it. So yeah, um, old school folks like us will love to revisit Transformers. And uh, yeah, it's on there, all of it. Even the more modern stuff after that, like Beast Wars, I think is on there. I think Tubi has most of the Transformers cartoon stuff. Cool. It, for us, go, it man. all kind of begins and ends with Generation One, though. Like, uh, maybe a little bit of Generation Two after they did the Transformers the movie, which at the time it was released was became my favorite movie. Yeah, uh, for a while. But yeah, once they got into like Beast Wars and stuff, we that we were too old for it. Then yeah, that yeah, we we lost interest, and also we were older and just kind of yeah. fell out of that whole bubble for sure. When do when did the GoBots come in? Right about at the same time, but they were weren't inferior. the GoBots like technically first? Mm, I, I mean, I think that probably some dickheads from the GoBots studio were sneaking <laughs> into the Transformers <laughs> studio and watching what they did, and they're like, "Oh, we got an idea here. Let's make right. a shitty version of this." All yeah, right, somebody go. in the all right, somebody in the comments. What was first, GoBots or Transformers? Uh, right. No, What's but I, I did see a thing that like GoBots came out a couple months before Transformers, but they certainly didn't. Um, didn't uh come up with the idea first i think weren't transformers a toy first and then the cartoon and i think gobots beat them to the airwaves with their cartoon but i think the transformers toy was first i'm That's not sure what I'm guessing was i the always deal. thought that gi joe and transformers were um the cartoon was simply made only to sell the toy yeah exactly so i think the toy was first i don't know i think so yeah. Well, we'll find out in the comments. Yeah, There's we'll definitely fight. somebody that knows better than us. All right, we have some Voyager Three news to get through. Um, kind of the same stuff that we've been mentioning. We have this wonderful new Doom Fortress album cover T-shirt on a corn silk yellow T-shirt, and the Doom Fortress album cover art in full color, direct to garment print on the soft spun ring spun cotton shirt so pick one up in the voyager 3 store v-o-y-a-g 3r store.com mm. and we want to let you know that we are going to be at motor hold City. on one second one second uh, you mentioned doom fortress but what are you wearing there what's that oh it's funny that you ask see yeah. i felt like testing the waters you want to see what i got <laughs> i do it's a are you synthetic t-shirt check it out there you go Come on, man. That's awesome. Yep. It's also, I, I don't think we should color. test the waters. I think we should flood them with all oh, those yeah. shirts, just thousands. Oh, man. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, those who are listening, if you want us to put this shirt into production and have it be available on the Voyager 3 store, leave a note in the comments or email us, askv3cast at gmail.com and let us know. And if we get enough people saying yes, then we'll put it up. And we'll probably and bo- also have them at Motor City Nightmares, too. And believe me, this was not planned. Steve just happened to be wearing that shirt, so <laughs> this was true. not planned. <laughs> yeah, Steve was just fresh out of laundry. That's yep. right. That's right. It's like laundry day at Steve's house, and that That's was right. literally all he had. Yeah, so speaking of Motor City Nightmares, Voyager 3 will be there. Uh, it's July 28, 29, and 30 at the Sheraton Novi Detroit Hotel. 
The headlining guest is none other than Bruce Campbell. He'll be there on the 29th and the 30th. And we will be there on the 29th and the 30th as well. And we're playing live on stage at the Saturday night, July 29th after party. So get your tickets at MotorCityNightmares.com and uh, join us. We're going to be hanging out all day, signing stuff, selling stuff. If you're lucky, Steve will do another walkthrough. I know we, uh, we've done that in the past. Are you going to do a walkthrough this time, Steve? Yep, I will. I'll do one for each day. I kind of cover um, what's going on and some of the tables that are set up with all the vendors. They have wonderful vendors with all kinds of stuff, stuff that's handcrafted. Stuff that's mass produced, uh, horror licenses, titles, um, sci fi stuff, toys, vintage, collectible stuff, you name it. And of course, Voyager 3 will be there with all of our vinyl, our CDs, our cassettes, our t shirts. Um, maybe we'll even do a little V3 cast segment from there. You never know. See if we can uh, talk to any of our celebs. Eugene Clark will be there. That's a, a buddy of ours that we met last oh, yeah. year. Big Daddy oh, yeah. from Land of the Dead. V3 cast will definitely say, go to his. Uh, set up and get the experience because you won't regret it. It's the yeah. highest value uh, ticket there. Autograph you yep. can get. You got yep. it. And, Man, and it goes all I out. guarantee you, uh, the three of us will be leaving that place with our wallets a little lighter. That's yes. right. It's true. As a matter of fact, we might have to have Eugene beat our ass a little bit. We might just have to do that. You know, like hey, Eugene, can we get the band discount? <laughs> How much for three of us at the same time? <laughs> and he'd be like, well, it's normally 20. I'm just making this up. It's normally 20. For you but guys, for you guys? Be 60. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, it's going to be times three. That's, that's my point. <laughs> okay. For our last segment of the show tonight, we have the awesome collecting cool stuff this time with Greg. What do you have, Greg? So this is a collecting cool stuff follow up. Oh, ooh. if you haven't seen the episode, I got something that I swore I would never get. Oh, I so, know where this is going. <laughs> so when I say I'm doing a collecting cool stuff follow up, what do you think mm -hmm. that means, Steve? I think you've completed a collection, I've completed a set, if you will. Of something that you weren't going to get originally. Now, that's just fucking cool. I'm sorry. That's awesome. Look at the yes. face paints See? and the tongue. Yes. Awesome. So as a result of Father's Day and my birthday, I now have the band back together. There you All go. Because right. there's no way I was getting away with just having Gene, right? No, I knew that at the moment. I just knew right. how much time would it take. Let's see it one more time. <laughs> yeah. That's so which look one's... The Peter, the, look at the Peter Cruz. He comes with a drum set. He comes with a little drum set. Completed the collection all at once. Man, that's so going to go. look good on the shelf. You there can't even are. look at them, Steve. Don't even take them out of the package. That's right. Yep. Don't <laughs> even look at them. that one. <laughs> look at yep. the old tiger on it. <laughs> that's awesome. I got to say, you know... The Peter Chris one is my favorite, and it's not, you know, I'm not biased, but that little drum set. Oh, that's like, killer. That's the, that's the icing on the cake. I got it. Mission accomplished. The that's band's nice. back together. They're on their farewell tour for the last time ever. And you right. have tickets, by the way. So do I. Do you, Steve? Dig. No, I don't. I don't. But I am going to three concerts, and I went to Cynic and um, Atheist last Friday. Nice. Yeah, Absolutely killer. Oh my God. I've always loved was it Cynic. Packed? Yeah, it was sold out. It was, a, it, was a, it was the first sellout on that tour, and they were about halfway through the tour at, at, at the Detroit stop. And I'll, I'll say, I first got um, introduced to Cynic because, in case people don't know this, um, a lot of the guys from Cynic played on Death Human album. Uh, Paul Masvidal, guitar, and Sean Reinhart was drums. And they, then, of course, they had Steve DiGiorgio from Sadus, right? Was he from from Sadus? Yeah. Uh, on bass, and then Chuck, of course. So I, f I found out about those guys from that. And then very shortly after, um, Focus came out, the their debut album, Cynic's debut album. And it's just w this wonderful combination of, it's still, got, it's still metal and death metal, but throw in a huge heaping of like, progressive rock and jazz with that where a lot of there's a lot of clean guitar with chorus playing 
complex chords with upper extensions and it's not just like bar chords. It's wonderful, textured, amazing. So I finally got to see them live last Friday at the Sanctuary in Detroit nice. and they played so good. Sounded just like the record. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace, Sean Reinhardt. I know. I know. As a matter of, oh, here's a cool tidbit that I had no idea of. You know, uh, Death to All, which is like the death tribute where they go out with um, mm -hmm. Gene Hoglin. And it was Sean at one point earlier on, like maybe six years ago, five years ago. Um, but right now it's Gene Hoglin and uh, Steve DiGiorgio and uh, Bobby, what, what's his name? It's, he, I think he played on um, Sound of Perseverance, I think, I believe. But I, I think his first name is Bobby. He's the other guitar player. And they have this guy. Um, now I'm going to forget his name. It's not Danny, is it? I, I forgot. I looked him up on Instagram because I wanted to confirm this. Um, and it turns out to be true is that the other guitar player um, beside Sean Reiner at, at, at Cynic is that guy. So they know each other, obviously, probably from the Florida scene. And that guy is like Chuck's doppelganger. If you've ever seen footage of Death to yeah. All, he's the closest thing to Chuck besides Chuck. It's ridiculous. Sure. So he's playing yeah. with Cynic. So he's that good of a player. Obviously, to be in death, you have to be anyway. So he's right. the other guitar player in Cynic right now. Because I'm cool. like, that guy looks familiar. Is that yeah. him? Could it be him? And when I got home, I looked it up, and it, it's him. <laughs> Sweet. So he's, he's, he's had a busy year because Death to All was on tour all spring. And then he probably had a couple of weeks off from that and went right out with Cynic for this. Like They're probably on like four or five-week tour. It's a lot of dates on there. Nice. So um, if you're a fan of Cynic or Atheist, check your local listings and see if they've passed by your town yet. It's I totally recommend the show. It's absolutely fantastic. Sweet. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of V3Cast. We want to say again, thank you to Peter Mengede for stopping in and sharing some awesome stories about Helmet and Handsome. It was super cool to hear about that stuff because like that, that's one of my favorite bands of all time, Handsome, for sure. And uh, if you like... Uh, progressive rock synth soundtrack band uh, doing a podcast and talking about cool stuff, give our channel here a like and a subscribe. And until the next time on V3Cast, we'll see you soon.